To humans, wake up, wise up, do what you can individually and together. When I was a student at an English university studying conservation biology, something that was strikingly absent was the inclusion of indigenous knowledge within my lectures. Since finishing university, I've recognised this absence can be attributed to institutionalised racism within both the education and conservation sectors. My education sorely lacked this non westernized ancient knowledge that I am now so passionate about including within my work and research as an environmental scientist. When I read an article about Ocean Mercia's research and the Moana project that she runs, and having recently spent two years travelling around New Zealand, I had to reach out to her to speak to her about how Māori knowledge is feeding into the research being conducted by herself, her peers and her PhD students. The project recognises the values and merit of both Indigenous and Western techniques, using both to produce some amazing research that could hold the key to saving species, ecosystems and even improving human resilience against the negative impacts of climate change. When I read your research on that Monga Bay article, I was like, oh my goodness, I wanted to talk to somebody who does this kind of research the entire time I was in New Zealand. And mm. I was so interested in learning about Maori knowledge and about all of that kind of stuff. And it, I only really got to interact with that in museums and online and never in person. And when I was reading that article, I was like, oh my goodness, I want to talk to her so much. Like, I really, really hope that she comes back to me <laughs> um, and that we can have a conversation just so that I can learn more. And I, the reason I wish that I'd had that knowledge and that accessibility when I was there was because I went to all of these places that I know are really, really special, like Kaikoura. Mm -hmm. And deepening your knowledge of those places in not only a scientific way but in and in indigenous knowledge way makes you so in tune with the landscape and mm -hmm. it's something that as a as a western trained scientist I love getting more of a deeper understanding about because I've never had any training in that whatsoever it's something that we don't even touch on at English universities really when it comes to mm -hmm. environmental science and it's something that's so important. Mm. Um, so thank you in advance for being able to join me. <laughs> oh, no worries. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah. I think let's start by if you could introduce yourself to the Earth to Humans audience, because I already I've read your research. So I, I know a little bit about you already. Well, kia ora. Uh, be well, as we say in the Maori language from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm Ocean Mercia. Uh, I hail from a tribe on the east coast of the North Island called Ngāti Poro through my mum. But I have descent lines uh, that link to Cornwall, England, um, through my dad. So I'm a little bit of a mixed breed, uh, but very proudly and strongly Ngāti Poro. And I am the head of the school at uh, Te Kawa a Māori. And Te Kawa a Māori is the School of Māori Studies at uh, Victoria University of Wellington, uh, at the capital city in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And uh, I've worked there for getting close to 20 years now as a lecturer. And uh, my, my background, I did my PhD in physics, but for the last 17, 18 years have been exploring, I guess, the interface between science and Māori knowledge and Indigenous knowledges. And so I have a good home to explore that, the linkages between Māori studies and science. 
in a school of Māori studies. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me. And your research focuses on, if I'm not mistaken, things to do with the ocean <laughs> and fresh water. So you could not have been named any more of an appropriate <laughs> name, really. It was like your your future was written in the stars from the second your your parents gave you that name. <laughs> um, yeah. Are they are they kind of into the ocean too? Are they ocean people? <laughs> I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, the origin of the name is, you know, from the actual ocean. And yes, it is spelt O-C-E-A-N. And we lived by on the south coast of Wellington, the North Island, which is a really rugged coastline. It gets huge winds and is, is just basically a vanguard for well, it's the, it's, the, it's the first kind of block uh, between Antarctica and the North Island as a landmass. So, yeah, so they, they lived on, on the coast there when I was born. And um, it took them a while to get around to naming me. But Ocean, I think, was quite fitting given where we, um, where we were living um, and where the first place that I was raised. So, yes, as you say, I was destined to become like a, micro, a marine biologist or a or something and have taken a bit of a circuitous route back to oceans research because it's only actually in the last three years that I've taken on this project or this role on the Moana project, Moana meaning ocean, as a researcher. And that area of Wellington is actually not where your ancestral land is, am I right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So would that be on the East Cape? Yeah, so it's a little bit south of the East Cape, which is a good nine hours drive from where I'm currently living, which is in Wellington, the capital city, the furthest south um, on the North Island. So we do get back to the um, the coast, as we call it, from time to time. But, um, you know, our lives and our careers, and I'm talking here about myself and my brother and sisters, are in Wellington. So, yeah, we, we have connections to the coast and if I introduce myself I'll use this phrase I'll say ko hikurangi te maunga which means Mount Hikurangi is my mountain I'll say ko waiapu te awa the river waiapu is my river ko Ngāti Poro te iwi and my tribe is is Ngāti Poro so as tribal peoples, we, we often introduce ourselves first in relation to the landscapes that our people come from and um, have remained connected to over the generations. So, uh, so, so those, those landscape features, the, the mountain and the river, are kind of in my consciousness, if not in my everyday. And something with my really basic knowledge of Māori culture and history that connection to the landscape is something that runs very deep Mm. and the fact that you introduce yourself in that way speaks of that connection so I wondered if you would be happy to just take us back to that I know that I think the settlement of New Zealand by Polynesian people started happening around 800 years ago Mm. and if we think about something that blows my mind is how those people got over to Aotearoa in the first place, because mm. you, when you think about what you've just mentioned about that being the, the south of the North Island being one of the first places from Antarctica that you reach and that sea is so rough. <laughs> yeah, um, Getting across to those places is really must have been a serious struggle and the navigation and all of that kind of stuff. I know that that's a really important part of that history. Yeah, as you say, there's um, a really interesting history of the ancestors of the Māori people, Polynesian peoples, deliberately mounting expeditions, I suppose you could call them, resettlement expeditions that may have followed on from a period of exploration We've certainly got some amazing oral histories about people who came to these islands from Polynesia and they went back again to fetch family. We've got uh, a story on the East Coast about uh, Paikea who rode on the back of a whale between the islands and here. We've got stories about voyagers and explorers who who followed, uh, who chased, you know, an octopus so there's these amazing stories of marine life 
helping humans find their way to these islands. And so there is science packaged up in those stories, of course. So we could think, okay, well, you know, it's possible, I suppose, that someone could have literally ridden on the back of a whale. But another way to interpret that story is that the whales during their migration were a really helpful part of the navigator's toolkit, their observation toolkit, let's say. So, of course, we, when we think about navigation over the oceans, we think about the, the importance of stars and the importance of knowing the constellations that you'd expect to see at different latitudes. Uh, so, but there's also the, the elements, the prevailing winds, the swells and the, the prevailing directions of the swells. And there's then, of course, animal migrations and the ways that birds behave when they're close to islands at different parts of the day. So... Uh, I've heard some navigators talk about how actually the stars are easy to read and it feels a bit mind-blowing really because, I mean, I personally don't have any practical experience at navigation, although there is some amazing efforts in revitalizing traditional navigation methods that I'm connected with. I've never actually been out on the waka myself, so hopefully on the on the horizon for me. But yeah, so so to hear the Hawaiian navigator talking about how following particular stars was like a big signpost in the sky. It was so easy to, to chart a course by, um, by the view of particular stars if you knew what you were looking for and knew when to look for it. It's, it's pretty mind-blowing, and uh, there's a lot of knowledge locked up in just the stars, let alone following other signs of navigation and nav navigating at sea. So yeah, it's a pretty stunning achievement that, you know, these voyages were deliberate. There were, there have been speculations that they were accidental and drift voyages, but that's, you know, been pretty much debunked now. And so, yeah, just going back to your question about the research that we're doing now and how that sort of builds upon the picture and what we know about our ancestral navigation practices. Uh, so on the Moana project, one of our, I guess, invitations is to think about Māori as oceanographers. So to think about that Indigenous science that was practiced, you know, in the most dangerous of conditions sometimes. As you said, the waves on the south coast of Wellington are just something else. And this is um, yeah near the coast, so so you had to have a very robust and reliable practice to even think about putting not just yourself and your navigator, your captain, and your crew at risk putting to sea, but a migrating party that included your um, your families and your children and your your pets and food sources for a long journey. And we are talking, you know, weeks long in, in some of these cases to make these journeys. So it's no mean feat. And it's, yeah, it's pretty, um, a pretty stunning achievement. Yeah, so going back to what we're looking at in our project, we are, we're interested in, I guess, philosophically, the way that Indigenous knowledges and the science of oceanography uh, I guess the more modern oceanography, how they connect and can complement each other in different ways, particularly in the face of climate change that's increasing the temperatures of waters. We're in the middle of a marine heat wave at the moment. And long term, that's going to have some pretty drastic impacts on where the fish want to live. And if they move out of the migratory path of the whales, uh, and other creatures that rely on those sources. You know, there are huge potential disruptions in the warming seas, and not to mention ocean acidification. But within um, our oral histories, there are, or we believe, there are some really useful knowledges locked up in those that would tell us about the history of what the, um, the oceans were like, you know, 800 years ago, that can help to provide a bit of a baseline if you like, for our observations of climate changes in the marine environment. And I would love to know what aspects of Indigenous knowledge are lending themselves to the scientific studies that you're doing, because our focus on the podcast has been kind of the Americas and Indigenous people in that area. And I've read quite a lot of books on 
the way that those indigenous people view plants and how that's influencing their modern botany and how those things tie in together and how that ancient knowledge is being used in those ways but I would love to know if there is specific aspects that you are using that are helping so Mm. far. Yeah, well, one of the, uh, and there's been some published studies on this. Yeah, so there's been a study on oral histories that have been captured in proverbs. And some of these, uh, as an oral culture, we've got lots of different ways of recording and passing on our knowledge. And they include songs. And songs are great because, you know, when you know the tune, <laughs> it's actually easy for the lyrics to follow along. So, so waiata, as we call them, um, and there were lots of different types of songs that were designed slightly different rhythmically and melodically, but all had a slightly different purpose or a different way of transmitting knowledge and different kinds of knowledge that they were recording and transmitting. And so in these stories as well, there are uh, pūrāko, as we call them, different stories that tell about histories and some of these relate to tsunami, uh, major land movements. So uh, there's, there's a place up the coast of the west, west side of the North uh, Island uh, called Horo Whenua. And Whenua is land, and Horo means a kind of a rushing or a very sudden influx or outflux. And Horo Whenua, the name of that place, actually records, we think, a major tsunami event. And so we've had a lot of these tsunami events over the years. My colleague Bruce McFadgen has written uh, a book called Hostile Shores. His whole first chapter was dedicated to oral histories that, that could be interpreted or unpackaged to find information about tsunamis, where they occurred, when they occurred, when they occurred in relation to each other. And so if you've got enough oral histories you can put together a timeline. So there's a, there's a lot of information in those stories. But going back to the proverbs in this work of um, Priscilla Wehi and Hemi Fanga and colleagues, they've done some amazing survey work of the many, many proverbs. And there are thousands of them, like literally thousands that have been recorded, let alone the ones that have not been recorded. And they um, did a sweep and found hundreds of different proverbs that related specifically to marine mammals. And so from, and the, these were very specific mentions of very specific species and specific kind of variations within species. So there's a huge amount of naming knowledge that's in those proverbs and known generally as well. But there are also, they've teased out relationships between species and relationships between humans and the species through these proverbs. And by putting them all together in an archive, have found some really interesting patterns. And even to the extent where what they've found has challenged the traditional archaeological interpretations of our diets, uh, you know, sort of 700, 300 years ago. So that's a really good example of where without that oral history, you actually, you've got a skewed picture of, of what was what we were eating. <laughs> uh, so you're only getting uh, the archaeologist side of the story, but things like shark cartilage didn't last for 100 years in the middens. So, so that, that element of the diet was not visible to the archaeological record, but it was in our histories, in our, in our um, oral histories. And then so there's the place names as well. I mentioned Horo Whenua before, but and we're so fortunate here in Aotearoa in New Zealand that we do still have the place names embedded in some ways in the landscape. Some of them have been overwritten, like Wellington, for instance, but we still remember and we're bringing back the other names like Te Whanganui Atara, the Great Harbour of the Explorer Tara, and other names that can help us to or that are a recording of geological features, but also particular quality of water um, in the regions. They just they just tell us so much about previous observations of, of the landscape and its character. So, so there's a huge amount of knowledge that's locked up in those. And um, if we're creative about the way we bring that knowledge together and analyse it, it can give us so much more than what we currently have and know. I absolutely loved the names of things in, mm. New, in New Zealand, like the description of the landscape in the name 
of yeah. places like Aotearoa just on its own like the land of the long white cloud anyone that's ever been to New Zealand the clouds are completely unique I've never seen anything like it in my entire <laughs> life in my travels around the world and you're like yeah yeah that makes absolute complete sense and then you travel to other places and they have these really long beautiful names and you're like okay what's this one going to mean and it's just <laughs> it's awesome having those names and it's something that when I was in New Zealand I really tried to use and the pronunciation is very difficult <laughs> so I kind of I was like okay I'm going to strip this back to the bare bones and learn how the a and the u is like an o sound yeah, and nice, all of the it? yeah like pa- pa- um, what was it or papa toy toy oh, yes. yes yes that was it yeah just getting because obviously it's it's completely the opposite but I was like I'm going to try my best to make sure that I'm pronouncing these these names correctly and but the meaning of those names is just so beautiful and as someone that appreciates geography and and landscapes the description of it's just amazing obviously a similar thing a similar story all around the world with European colonization came this repression and destruction of culture and obviously you've mentioned all of these oral histories that have become available and thank goodness that the that certain aspects of the culture have managed to be maintained through this but obviously that time destroyed a lot of things that the original settlers had created with regards to the landscape so can we just go go to then and discuss how that has impacted Maori history and modern culture? I know that's a big question, but mm. I just mm. yeah. So um, the maybe I'll just get this point out at first, actually, and it's sort of going back to the the voyages when you mention Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. I mean that is also a description from a voyager's perspective, from a navigator's perspective, because when you're well off the coast but and not able to, to see the mountains or the coastline itself, you could still see just over the horizon the cloud that hangs over Aotearoa, New Zealand. So, so it's a kind of like a, a, a nice reminder that these lands are not just about lands, but they're also about the air column above them and the clouds that are part of the broader ecosystem there. And that was the exclamation when uh, when it was sort of like our version of land ho, Aotearoa, it's a cloud and it's a big one. So there's got to be land in that direction. And um, the story says that it was a woman who made that observation. So that's also pretty cool. But yeah, no, fast forwarding a little bit to colonisation of European settlers. And, um, you know, initially that was a a win-win for for both. Māori people had welcomed the influx of new technologies, certainly really keen to take advantage of the new materials and technologies that came with European settlers. But the, uh, the loss of resources through the alienation from lands that, you know, that's fast forwarding through some years um, and through various legislation um, uh, have been devastating for Māori, for Māori knowledges, especially when so many of our knowledges are related to a connection with land. You know, it's holding all the variations of those place names, not just the one that we remember now, needed to be done when you could walk out on the, on the land and, and recognise the, the logic and the story behind uh, uh, puke, puke Atua, the hill of the gods, and disconnection from lands, but also the resources on the lands, or taonga as we call them, whether they were bushes and shrubs or bark from trees for medicines, berries for food and, um, and, and other fruits, or they might have been reduced access to, to birds and, and fish and sea life. And, uh, and there were industries also that displaced other, I guess, more traditional um, subsistence lifestyle type connections and relationships. So, yeah, re- really devastating impacts. And we can never sort of underestimate the ongoing impacts of those as well, that kind of disconnection from that tradition of knowledge that 
was um, was built up over hundreds of years. Yeah, and we do feel it keenly now as a as we sort of bring ourselves as a people out of those difficulties. Uh, we lament the loss of our knowledges and and lands and um, and um, and health and all of that sort of thing. So obviously there is the Treaty of Waitangi, and how how does that fit into what's happening today? That was seen as like a big success story, but there's still a lot of things that aren't completely right. So how did that change things with regards to that history? Yeah, so uh, the treaty document and noting that not all chiefs signed it and Aotearoa New Zealand was made up of, you know, nearly 80 different sub-tribes and the tribal groupings around the country and there were many, many chiefs who signed, who but but many who also didn't. So, so we honour, I guess, the history of conscious non-ratification, I suppose, of the treaty by some of the tribes. So, yeah, and there because there are two different versions of the tribe, one in English and one in Te Reo Māori, and they don't say the same thing. That has been a huge point of contention over the years. And the treaty has been was used to alienate lands from Māori as used as a justification, but it was also ignored for many, many, many decades. And so it was a, a period of time in the 1970s that Māori activists, different groups, sought recognition of the treaty because the treaty is a beautiful document, especially uh, the one in Te Reo Māori. And of course, the the, the legal principle of contra preferentum means that as a society, generally speaking, we hold to the Māori version, the one that was was signed by the, the natives. Yeah, and it has wonderful principles that flow out from it of, of, of working together. I guess it's sort of the three Ps is the, the three most well-known principles that emerge from the treaty, and they are partnership, participation, like partnership, that's a wonderful thing. Participation uh, of peoples in, in all aspects of society and protection, protection of Māori language, ways of, of living, access to taonga, access to lands, fisheries, as well as the right to practice our rituals and um, knowledges. And, and so the principles that the Waitangi Tribunal agrees emerge from the treaty, what their sort of judge uh, claims of breaches of the treaty against. And so they've done an amazing job at looking at non-legal acquisitions of land and suggesting courses of action to the Crown. The Crown can choose to take that up or not, but there are many, many cases where an apology has come from the Crown to those people for those those grievances and those breaches of the treaty and some form of restitution and sometimes return of lands and, and assets. And these treaty settlement processes have, have been a bit rocky at times and some argue have kind of changed or or de-indigenized the, I guess, the way that we do things have trapped Māori people into a kind of a Western legalistic way of uh, exacting uh, some kind of justice. But they've also resulted in many of the, the tribes, the iwi, in becoming really amazing, really savvy investors, negotiators, activists, you know, uh, experts of the law and the ins and outs of the law. And, and I go come back to investors because, you know, the size of the Māori economy is now more than estimated to be more than $70 billion. So there is, I guess, uh, I mean, we don't want to put a dollar value on on hope and uh, the, the fate of a people. But, you know, there's huge, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Māori women were found to be some of the most entrepreneurial in the world. And so I guess as Māori, we've been resilient and ready to take on new things um, as the challenges have been have, have come to us. And, and that's a success story. But we, we, we deal with racism still, with being on the wrong side of all the worst statistics still. COVID hit us really hard. Um, as a people, and continues to we we continue to be overrepresented in the uh, the death statistics and the um, and the illness statistics and the under vaccinated statistics. So, 
So there are there are ongoing challenges for our people um, as a result of you know those decades and hundreds of years of of dealing with 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 removal from lands, yeah, and removal from those ancestral connections. And you touched on guardianship in um, in what you've just said, and I know that there is a lot of work going on to give tribal lands back and a small amount of progress is being made definitely not as much as there should be and not happening at the kind of speed that it should be either there are certain Maori principles that I encountered as I was moving around Aotearoa Mm. and one of them was the is it Rahui Mm, yeah so what was the what's the the thinking behind that because that in itself is a conservation technique and looking back on what we've talked about with regards to using ancient knowledge to in modern conservation this is just a Mm. (laughs) no-brainer for sure but could you discuss that technique I know it's definitely would be a part of your research (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So rahui is a um, a traditional technique that is basically puts an embargo on a particular area, and there are different reasons that the rahui could be put on the area. And traditionally, one of the ways that you would signal that there was a rahui in an area was by putting a stake in the ground with a kind of some kind of identifier at the top of the stake. So people knew, ah, oh, there's a rahui on here, as the, the you know, the, the rako, the stake is in the ground. Um, so they'd know, for instance, not to gather shellfish there at that time. They may not know the reasons for that, and there could be various reasons. So one of the, there was actually a rahui here last month at a sports ground in Lower Hutt, uh, where someone passed away while they were playing rugby, just playing a club rugby game. And so a rahui was put over the sports ground to respect the terrible thing that had happened there and to give time for the land to, in a sense, heal from the death that occurred there, but also the people of that particular neighbourhood to give them space to just step back from the sports field to reflect. And then it opened up again about a, a week later. So rahui were put in place to signify that something like that had happened. Maybe someone had drowned at sea or was missing at sea. And so in a Māori way of thinking, that's a tapu, kind of a tabu mm, situation. And so you wouldn't, yeah, you would just be more mindful of the the spiritual forces at work around death and and the closeness and de- of death and the association of the place with death over a particular time. But those times, uh, in that case, would be, you know, uh, days, weeks at the most, generally, unless there'd been a big battle and then you might designate the whole place as a wahi tapu, a place to that it might be decades or hundreds of years that that place retains its its status of being off limits to to particular kinds of activities so this was equally important in the environmental sustainability domain although we wouldn't have called it sustainability per se but if it was noticed that "Mm, there's not so many eels this year um, then we might be put in place to just tell people no sorry you're not you're not gathering any eels this summertime yeah, until the population regenerates itself. Where we've seen a really interesting modern day rahui is in relation to the Cody trees. So these wonderful, huge, tall, magic, majestic Cody trees, a potocarp tree has been beset by a disease called Cody dieback here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And uh, I don't know much about Cody dieback, how it works, but it's a there's some sort of um, disease of the roots that, that gets into the tree. And, and Arahui was put on a, a reserve in the north of Auckland, where there's a west of Auckland, sorry, where there's these beautiful old Cody trees. And the Rahui said that, look, it's not working that we, you, we're being, inviting people to clean their boots before they go into the forest because the problem is getting worse. So we're making a decision to stop people from walking in the forest in an effort to help the trees, to help them survive. 
Now that went down like a cup of cold sick, <laughs> telling people that they couldn't go for their, their walks or their runs or take their dogs into the Cody Forest. But sometimes you just have to make a hard call like that for the, the ongoing preservation and survival of, of species. Yeah. And Cody dieback is the next thing we're worried about is myrtle rust coming into the country. It's a very sensitive e- ecosystem here and we are fortunate to be, you know, miles away from anywhere, but we was still, you know, importing goods by the by the container load. And so yeah. I guess that isolation is good in some ways, but also it means that those all of the species in New Zealand have evolved in the absence of external factors. So yeah, yeah it's it is, a yeah, double edged sword. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right. When I was traveling around New Zealand, like obviously there were these Rahui. So I went to mm. the west coast of uh, Auckland and was oh, devastated. Yeah. But as an environmental scientist, I was like, right on, like, thank you for doing this. Because mm. there's areas that I've been to in the UK, there's there's a dieback as well uh. happening and they haven't closed areas. And as an environmental scientist, you go there and you're like, OK, you can see the trees dying. Mm. and they it hasn't been locked off and that value on nature is so low and it's so depressing and they there's this kind of attitude of oh well we can almost just replace it with of non-scientists or we'll just replace it with exotic species that aren't Mm. um and it that aren't going to die from those diseases and it's it's really really depressing to see so Mm. when I arrived there was part of me that was disappointed but part of me that was like I love it here (laughs) (laughs) this place rocks like come on like this is I totally support this and I'm just going to go to the beach instead that's cool like you you just you you call retreats do you just carry on um healing so that was that was something I actually really loved oh that's really affirming yeah yeah thank you Um, but then there are these there's these places that are tapu as well that I remember so I lived in Wanaka for a while Oh. And there's Tapu Islands in Lake Wanaka mm. that I had a paddleboard and I was talking to people in the lake. I was like, oh, I, I would really, really like to go there. And they're like, oh, no, that's Tapu. Mm. And you're like, oh, OK, like, cool. Yeah, I definitely obviously won't go there. But that level of respect, I know that it's not unanimous. And I know that there are probably people that don't respect that. But generally speaking, that level of respect for the landscape and for that culture is there and I hope that I hope that I wasn't just in an isolated bubble of people that do respect that but is that an observation that you think is correct is it yeah I I would think so I mean I I haven't come across you don't come across many people or hear about many examples of people really deliberately transgressing the cultural values of a place as long as they know about them and so there's there's generally a a level of respect for if not total understanding at least respect for for those and and um and and those people probably well I mean there there might be a mixture of things like uh, people might say to outsiders oh that place is tapu don't go there but they themselves might go there sneakily with their white bait nets. <laughs> so, so you never quite know. Yeah, and knowing is really important too because there are many freshwater springs around the place and some of them are considered tapu, but you wouldn't necessarily know about them if they're not signposted or, or if you don't hear that from a ranger or a local person, an iwi person. And so I think if you innocently kind of go to a place that you find out later is tapu that's you know that's okay that's it's kind of about your intentions and your heart you have mentioned the moana project so i'd love to know more about this and what you're currently working on with regards to that yeah well to be honest with you my particular role on the project is the dishwasher and form filler outer and supervise the students sort of person <laughs> but we've got amazing students on the project one of whom is working on revitalizing the populations of toheroa which is an amazing huge shellfish uh, a real delicacy 
was served up as royal soup back in the 50s or 60s, I believe. Uh, so there was a huge industry around canned tohiroa uh, a few decades ago now, which um, which overfished the supply, overharvested. And uh, so we're suffering the, the scarcity now. And one of my students is... Um, is doing a survey for any spat, any larvae that she can find in her in her tribal region. Uh, so that's really exciting to see what whether she finds anything for a start and what we can do with the, what she does find. We've got another student who is uh, working on kinna, the sea urchin. That's a, a delicacy for us. Again, she's working with a, a tribal community who've reached out to us looking for help from someone who's a microbiologist who can also do some DNA on the kinna populations there. And very little is known about, about that. I mean, it's actually quite shocking when you look into how little is, is known about the DNA, the, the populations, the, the, um, the variations, the dynamics, even what, um, what's predating on the, these native delicacies. And kinna is a real Māori have a very strong relationship with kinna. It's a delicious, the sea urchin, delicious kai. Uh, cork food uh, and we've got another student who's working on climate change uh, and talking to navigators about their observations of climate change as they practice their um, traditional navigation skills in contemporary contexts and anyway so we've got these these students so we're building the capability of these students because this is another impact of colonization is the the education systems have not served us well over the years. And so we have a dearth of Māori people who are doing science, science and scientists. And so this is also partly about building the capacity and the capability of Māori students to support community interests. That's awesome. Like, I'm really, really excited to see what the results of that research are. And mm. just the just touching on the shellfish, like there's... You go to a beach in New Zealand and there is the most unique array of shells Mm -hmm. you'll ever see in your life. I'm obsessed with power shells. I just think they're the most beautiful things in the entire world. And for anyone that doesn't know, power are these big shellfish with the inside of them and the outside when it's polished. It's like this mermaid, beautiful. Oh, man, it's just this absolutely beautiful. And it's amazing. It's great to hear that they're because I know how endangered a lot of these shellfish are that there's that there's work going into that and then it's working with the local iwi and and that kind of thing so it just sounds like a really amazing project and something that will be really really well supported as well like by everybody who's going to be involved so Mm. yeah yeah mermaid's a great description for the power shell (laughs) The rippling blues and purples and greens, yeah, they were a wonderful, wonderful food. Yeah, absolutely. I, obviously, I know that with a lot of the oral history um, and the stories that have been passed down, mm. the story of the creation of Aotearoa is something that I just loved that story. And obviously, mm. it's so it's so intrinsic to everything that Aotearoa represented to me and everything. I just wondered if you would be happy to just give us a really brief mm. that as a yeah. really brief story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, lo- I'd love to. Yeah. Bedtime love- story. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm not much of a storyteller, but I've, I can give you a character and main events. <laughs> and the main character in this wonderful story is Maui, who's, as you know, um, a, an amazing folk hero in the Pacific. And he's he was a god, but he was also a human being. So he had very human impulses and characteristics. And he suffered adversity as a child because he was, he was born early and um, rejected by his parents. And so, and as the youngest child of five, he was also, you know, just always at the back end of things. But in spite of that, and in spite of that adversity, he really distinguished himself with some amazing feats. And one of those was he went out, took his waka out one day and went fishing. And um, he caught in a, uh, a much larger fish than he had anticipated. So sought the help of his, his brothers, his four brothers to help him pull up this fish. And um, this fish became the North Island of Aotearoa. And if you look at a map of Aotearoa, you'll see um, that it is, looks like the shape of a fish with the fins on the 
east and west side of the island and the tail stretching out past the uh, north of Auckland and, um, and Northland there. And uh, the, the head of the fish um, right where I am in, um, in Wellington and uh, so there's a story about how the fish, they, they carved up the fish and that became the mountains and, um, and the, the rivers of blood became the waterways of the fish. And the canoe that they, that they fished, up the island, the, uh, yeah, fished up the fish and the island from became the South Island of New Zealand. So, yeah, I mean, it shows a really, a, a really sharp, acute understanding of geography and the, the shape of the islands to, to come up with a story like that to explain that. So, yeah. And obviously this is way before satellites or anything. Yeah, actually, absolutely. <laughs> which when I thought about it, I was like, okay, so when was this, what was this story just made? Like, how did they... That absolutely blows my mind, that yeah. level of knowledge of the shape of a place when you have not seen it from above. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But it also suggests to me that actually maybe our ancestors, you know, mountains were seen as tapu in the tops of mountains, often seen as tapu. But actually, um, you know, if you get high enough, you get a good view um, of your landscape not to mention traveling around the coast. So I think I think there were um, a couple of vantage points that were used to construct that geography. Amazing. Well, thank you so, so, so much for that. Like I... Oh, thanks, Anna. Yeah, have enjoyed chatting to you so much and me you just too. made me want to come back. Oh, yes, yeah, come <laughs> back. Our borders are open now. No, my heart of my, as we say, come on back, you're welcome. <laughs> Well, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people all around the world desperately wanting to come to New Zealand now that now that those borders have opened and um, maybe even more after this podcast. So <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Today's episode was produced by me, Hannah Mulvaney, and our senior producer, Serena Simons. If you use social media, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram for deeper dives into the podcast. And if you're feeling really kind, you could even head to Apple Podcasts and Spotify to rate us so that other people who want to learn more about the beautiful planet that we live on can find us too. Thank you so much for listening.